Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Stanford University. Today, I'll be talking to you about blood pressure, focusing on how to measure it. This video will cover a lot of ground. By the end, you'll be able to define blood pressure, including the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure. Next, you'll be able to define the chord cough sounds and the auscultatory gap, to choose an appropriate size blood pressure cuff for patients of different sizes, to demonstrate proper technique when manually measuring a patient's blood pressure, to list common pitfalls with blood pressure measurement, to list indications for blood pressure measurement, and last, to define hypertension and hypotension. You can summarize these objectives as the what, how, and why of measuring blood pressure. So first, what is blood pressure? Blood pressure is simply the pressure exerted by circulating blood on the walls of the arteries. It is one of the most important physiological parameters of the body, which is why it's included in the five vital signs, along with temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. The physics of blood pressure is remarkably complex, but the basic factors which determine it include the heart rate, myocardial contractility, which refers to how hard the heart is squeezing, vascular tone, which refers to how much the arteries are constricted or relaxed, blood volume, blood viscosity, and last, arterial compliance, which refers to how much give or elasticity the arteries have. As a consequence of the cardiac cycle, blood pressure is cyclical. Myocardial contraction is also called systole, so the high point of the blood pressure which occurs during contraction is called the systolic blood pressure. Relaxation of the heart is called diastole, and thus the low point of the blood pressure occurring at the very end of diastole is called the diastolic blood pressure. Whenever you hear blood pressure reported as two numbers, such as 150 over 80, that's the systolic and diastolic pressure. We use archaic units for measuring blood pressure called millimeters of mercury, which refers back to the days when mercury manometers were the principal measuring tool. We don't use mercury-containing devices anymore due to concerns about their toxicity, but their associated units still persist. Before we get to the actual procedure of measuring blood pressure, there are two phenomena of which you need to be aware. The court cough sounds and the auscultatory gap. The cord cough sounds are rhythmic noises heard using a stethoscope that are produced by turbulent blood flow in an artery, usually the brachial artery, that is being partially compressed by a blood pressure cuff. It occurs when such compressive pressure is between the person's systolic and diastolic pressures. At pressures higher than systolic, blood flow is cut off altogether, and at pressures lower than diastolic, there is no compression of the artery at any point in the cardiac cycle. But when the pressure is in between the systolic and diastolic pressure, the artery alternates between compressed and open, creating turbulence, and the cord cough sounds. Something called an auscultatory gap occurs in a small minority of patients. It is present when there is a range of blood pressures in between the systolic and the diastolic in which there are no cord cough sounds. It's observed primarily in older patients with a wide pulse pressure, that is, a relatively large difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures. The auscultatory gap is important because a failure to recognize its presence can result in a significant underestimation of the systolic pressure or an overestimation of the diastolic pressure. The equipment for blood pressure measurements is very simple a standard stethoscope, and something called a sphygmomanometer. Most people colloquially call this thing a blood pressure cuff, which is a misnomer since the cuff is only part of it, specifically the part that goes around the patient's arm. The other parts of the sphygmomanometer include the pressure gauge, the inflation bulb used to inflate the cuff, and a one-way valve which can be twisted to regulate the flow of air from the cuff, controlling its rate of deflation. Depending on your equipment, the gauge may be either mounted on the wall, attached to a small rolling stand, or be small enough to be hooked directly onto the cuff itself. 
Regarding the best timing as to when blood pressure should be measured, keep in mind that blood pressure varies throughout the day and can be temporarily impacted by exercise or caffeine consumption within the prior 30 minutes. Also, for patients taking antihypertensive medication, consider the timing of the meds relative to the blood pressure measurement. In general, it's preferable to measure blood pressure immediately before the meds are usually taken, but this is often not practical if a patient's clinic visit is relatively late in the day. In addition, there may be specific situations in which measurement shortly after meds are taken is instead preferred, for example, if a patient has been complaining of lightheadedness, which could be due to excessive medication. So now, what's the actual procedure? First, although this is often omitted in practice, it's recommended that the patient first empty his or her bladder, as a full bladder may slightly elevate the pressure. Also, it's important that the patient be resting in a quiet room for at least five minutes beforehand. But once the patient has been resting and calm for a few minutes, and you've washed or otherwise sanitized your hands, you can begin. Next, the patient should be properly positioned. For ambulatory patients, this means seated with back supported, both feet flat on the floor, and with their arms supported at approximately the level of the heart. If there is not a tray or table on which the patient can rest their arm, you will need to support it for them while performing the measurement. Failure to properly position the patient may result in an elevated reading, which does not represent their true resting blood pressure. In most cases, it does not matter which arm you choose. However, there are some circumstances in which it does. The most common of these situations is with a patient who is on hemodialysis for whom you should avoid measurement of blood pressure in the same arm as the dialysis access. Be sure that the upper arm can be exposed without constricting it by a tightly rolled up sleeve. If this cannot be done, the patient will need to remove their outer layer of clothing. You'll want to be sure to have selected the proper sized cuff. There is some variability between different manufacturers, but most have about five sizes of arm cuffs ranging from infant to large adult with a sixth extra large size labeled thigh. Guidelines recommend that the length of the bladder inside the cuff, which is the chamber in which the air is contained, should be 80 to 100 percent the circumference of the arm. I honestly don't know anyone who manually checks this with a tape measure, but luckily many cuffs have a helpful guide printed on their inside aspect. You can see here a range in which the opposite edge should lie when the cuff is wrapped snugly around the patient's arm. If it falls within the range, the cuff is good. If it doesn't, you need to look for a different size. In the rare occasion in which a patient's arm is too large for the large adult size, you may need to use an adult thigh cuff on the arm. Wrap the cuff around the arm such that the bottom edge is about 2 to 3 centimeters above the crease of the elbow. The cuff will have a marking, usually an arrow, which should be aligned to rest over the approximate location of the brachial artery. In order to avoid problems with the auscultatory gap, the systolic pressure should first be estimated from the pulse obliteration pressure. This will also help to prevent an unnecessarily excessive cuff inflation that will be uncomfortable for the patient. To do this, ignore your stethoscope just for a moment and instead place one or two fingers over the radial pulse. Once you're confident that you can feel it, turn the valve to the closed position and slowly inflate the cuff until the pulse disappears completely. The pressure at which that occurs is approximately the systolic pressure. Once you have an estimate for the systolic pressure, place the stethoscope over the brachial artery, which can be aided by tucking in one edge under the cuff. Inflate the cuff to 30 millimeters of mercury above the pulse obliteration pressure, and turn the valve to the open position just enough to decrease the pressure by about 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury for each heartbeat. At one point, you'll begin to hear the cord cough sounds. Even though the sounds may not initially be constant, the pressure at which you hear the very first thump is the systolic pressure. Continue to slowly lower the pressure. At some point, the sounds will abruptly become muffled, and just a little bit below that, they'll disappear altogether. Although in the past, some experts recommended using the muffling pressure as the diastolic pressure, general consensus is currently that the pressure at which these sounds disappear completely should be used instead, 
as it's easier to identify and thus is more reproducible. Continue to lower the pressure for at least 10 millimeters of mercury below the disappearance of sounds to ensure that you have accurately identified the diastolic pressure. The procedure should be performed at least twice. The final recorded blood pressure should be the average of all readings taken in the same sitting, rounded off to the nearest 2 millimeters of mercury. You may observe the gauge needle beating within the same range of pressure as when the cord cuff sounds are present, and it may be tempting to use this visual observation as a surrogate for auscultated blood pressure. However, this is not advised since there may not be complete agreement between the needle's oscillations and the cord cough sounds. After measurement is complete, don't forget to tell the patient the result, as they will likely be anxious to know it. There are five common mistakes that both novices and experienced professionals alike make when measuring blood pressure. First, not allowing the patient to rest quietly before measurement. Measurements of the blood pressure in a patient immediately after they've rushed into clinic because they are running late and are stressed out from the drive and from having trouble finding parking is unlikely to be accurate. Second, not bothering to change the cuff from the default size already attached to the gauge, even if not appropriate for the patient. The usual situations in which this might occur is when a so-called regular-sized cuff is the only one in the room, but you are either seeing a small child or are seeing a morbidly obese adult. If the cuff is not the right size, it will not give you an accurate reading, and inaccurate data is more dangerous than an absence of data. So familiarize yourself with where the clinic or hospital keeps different sized cuffs and use the correct size. Third, not first checking the pulse obliteration pressure, giving the patient preventable discomfort, and also risking an underestimation of the systolic pressure due to the presence of an auscultatory gap. Fourth, allowing the patient to support his or her own arm, which will lead to a false elevation of pressure. And last, lowering the cuff pressure too fast, which can lead to either a falsely low systolic pressure, a falsely high diastolic pressure, or both. So far, I've discussed what blood pressure is and how it's measured. I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about why we would want to measure blood pressure in the first place. Specifically, what are its indications? Well, fortunately, they are simple to summarize. If you are a healthcare professional evaluating a patient, you should be checking the patient's blood pressure, irrespective of the patient's age, reason for evaluation, the presence or absence of symptoms, and location of care. The one exception to this is healthy children under the age of three being seen for a well-child visit, in whom the rates of blood pressure abnormalities are exceptionally low. And what are the abnormalities of blood pressure that you're looking for? First, there is hypertension, which refers to blood pressure that is too high. Although in practice, no one uses this precise terminology, you can think of there being two broad categories of hypertension, chronic and acute. Chronic hypertension the overwhelming majority of which is primary hypertension, is defined as either a systolic pressure of 140 or greater, or a diastolic of 90 or greater, as measured at two separate visits. Primary hypertension is important to identify with routinely screening the blood pressure because it's asymptomatic, but if left untreated, it will increase the risk of heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, and vision loss. Acute hypertension which in practice is referred to as a hypertensive crisis, is further subcategorized as hypertensive emergency if the patient has evidence of end organ damage, such as confusion, shortness of breath, or kidney failure, or hypertensive urgency if the blood pressure is acutely high, but the patient is otherwise doing okay. Although some clinicians teach specific cutoffs for how high blood pressure should be when diagnosing an acute hypertensive crisis, I don't recommend using such cutoffs. Instead, I consider the patient's baseline blood pressure, other medical problems, and how quickly the hypertension has developed. On the other hand, hypotension refers to blood pressure that is too low. It is almost always an acute problem. There is no specific cutoff value, but rather categorizing a patient as hypotensive depends on the patient's baseline blood pressure, other medical problems, and on the presence of either symptoms or signs of end-organ dysfunction.
Symptoms can include lightheadedness or confusion. Signs of end organ dysfunction can include low urine output and a variety of abnormal blood tests. Hypotension is also usually a medical emergency as it can lead to both temporary and permanent damage to any organ in the body rather quickly and if it progresses may lead to death. That concludes this video on blood pressure measurement. I hope you found it to be helpful. If so, please remember to like and share it. And consider subscribing to our channel Strong Medicine to check out our other videos on a variety of medical topics for healthcare professionals in training.